bet you could have used a minute Just a little time alone But you let me be your little shadow Following wherever you would go Then I got a little older And you gave me space to grow I don't ever seem to tell you enough But I want you to know When God made you my mother He knew who I'd need When God made you my mother He was being good to me I come to you with all my secrets And you never ever judge And when I'm falling in my weakness You give me strength to stand back up No amount of miles could separate us No place where I don't feel your love You say I'm the gift that heaven gave you But mama, I'm the lucky When God made you my mother He knew who I'd need When he picked you from the others He could already see That you would be my hero And everything I wanna be When God Happy Mother's Day. God bless you. I'm so happy to be here with you today. My name is Pastor Sel Mendoza. I'm Pastor David's wife, or he's my husband. <laughs> right? Um, now, uh, welcome. Welcome everyone watching online. Welcome everyone here. Now, how many mothers do we have here today? Show of hands. Now, I know that this is a special day, so I want to recognize you. Um, before you stand up, though, I want to, I'm going to ask you to stand, but I also want to include uh, mother figures out there. Maybe you are a mentor to young adults or children. I want you to stand up. And also, somebody, anyone out there who is believing for a pregnancy, you're married and you're believing for a pregnancy this year, or maybe you've had trouble recently and you're believing for, for that child, I want you to stand up in faith as well. So all mothers stand up today. I want to say a special prayer for you. Amen. Amen. They look so beautiful. I love the pink, the blue, all the flower dresses. So beautiful. We love you, moms. Now, those of you um, sitting next to them, I want to ask you to extend your hand out. And if you feel comfortable, you can even put your hand on their shoulder. Maybe it's your mama, your, your a sister. Um, let's, let's pray for them. And And let's declare this word that is spoken about in Proverbs 31. We all know this woman. I, I, I like to kid around and I say, this, this woman in Proverbs 31, she makes her own clothing. I wish I was more like her. But um, this, this is a declaration for all women. And this is what we strive to be with our hearts. And it says in Proverbs 31, verse 25, strength and dignity are her clothing. And she laughs at the, time to, at, at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom. And the teachings of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household. And she does, need the, does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also. And he praises her. Many women have done excellently. But you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. So we want to bless the women. We pray for them. Father, we thank you for, for all the moms here today, Lord, for those believing to be a mother soon. Lord, I ask for a special blessing over them, um, that you would shower them with your love, that you would shower them with strength, with joy. And if there's anyone here today that maybe have um, some sadness in their heart because they don't have their 
their mom. Maybe their mom has gone up to heaven, but we just pray a special rejoicing for them, Lord, that you would allow them to remember those good times, those beautiful memories with their loved one. And I pray for those that are believing to be a mom soon, Lord. I pray a blessing over their womb, Father God, that your will be done unto them. I thank you for all that you've done and all that you will do. In the holy name of Jesus, we say amen and amen. Let's praise the Lord. Amen. He is good. You may take a seat, moms. So we, we bless you, and, and we're so happy that you're here. I also want to thank the family members, the sons, the daughters who, who maybe you don't always come to the church with your mom, but today she said, you want to come with me, and I want you to come with me because it's Mother's Day, and you said, yes, I'm right there. One of my kids wanted to stay home, and I used that line on them, and it worked. I was like, no, it's Mother's Day. I don't care if you're tired or you had a long day yesterday. It's Mother's Day. We're taking a picture after this, so you come with me. I need all of you all here. So that, that brings me to there's a picture booth in the front. If you haven't gone by there, be sure to walk by afterwards, take a picture. We have one of our team members taking pictures and giving you a QR code where you can go later and find your, your picture. You can also take a look at all the other beautiful pictures. So isn't that wonderful? Um, so beautiful. Um, and so let's get started with today's lesson. Um, these, uh, the title of today's lesson, if you like to take notes, it's Led into Refreshment. Amen. Now, have you all been with us the last few weeks when Pastor David has been sharing with us about the Sermon on the Mount? It's been so good, right? It's been such a blessing to, to hear him share about the words of Jesus. And I love, I love it when we, I open up my Bible and, and in the New Testament, I don't know if you have one of those Bibles that has the words of Jesus in red. So if you see that, pay extra attention because Jesus is teaching us, right, through his words. And these are words that have transcended time, have transcended thousands of years, and we're still learning from them today. Um, and, and those um, sermons, you can catch them online, you can go back and review them. Um, Pastor David has been sharing about the character that the word speaks about that we should have as kingdom people. How many kingdom people do we have here today? Amen. <laughs> We have to be proud of that, amen, rejoice in that, not be ashamed of, of declaring who we are, but there's certain characteristics that come with that. So we've learned about that. Last week we learned about how we as believers were the salt of the earth, amen, how you are the light of the world, and you're like, thank you very much. I love, those, I love that that's called upon me, but that comes with something, right? That comes with a responsibility that as we go out into the world, we, we display a character that's... Christian, Christ-like, right? That more and more that as people see you out in, in your work setting, at home, that, that they don't know that you're Christian just by what, that you tell them you're Christian, but that they know you're Christian by your works, by what you do, by faith and works together, amen? That's, that's an effective faith. And um, so that's what we've been learning about. And then now this past week, we had what's called TFC Nights. Do you all know what that is? Well, we actually had that time here in this campus in your church. Now, if you missed it, I'm sorry, but there'll be another chance. We had services Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It was like a mini retreat, like a mini camp. It's kind of like the, the, the topic we had going where we come into this place and we're just ready to receive from the Lord. And let me share with you, it was amazing. It was so powerful. Maybe you watched it online and, and that's, that's wonderful. I'm glad that you watched it online. But let me tell you, there, the watching online does not compare to being here in person. So next time you, I know sometimes we're sick and we, we, we need to stay at home, but next time you don't have a very valid reason to stay home, remember that what you're watching online does not compare when you're in the room. We even cut the feed earlier, like 8.15, an hour 15 or something like that into it. But we kept going. We kept going to 8.30. Each day kept kept going longer, 8.40, 8.50, and then the last day, we kind of, we kept going, and we said, okay, the worship team needs to take a break, like, it's okay, we, we've had them for two hours, but it, it was just beautiful, and I just want to share part of what we experienced that night. I want us all as a church to, to be in that same accord, to be in that same place, so that we're, we're in the same level ground, and that you know what's happening in your church, Amen. So I want to get us up to speed with that. 
And I'm gonna go over several points. It's gonna be a total of three points where, where I will encourage you on some things. And again, it's in the same spirit of what's been happening here in the church. So first, go with me to Psalm 100, verse four, verses four and five. How many of you have your um, Bibles with you? Raise them up. Raise up the word of God. Amen. Praise God for you who remembers to bring the Bible. Let's, if you have a Bible somewhere on your shelf, bring it out. Bring it. it. It's so beautiful to just go through the pages and see what's written. The phone is great. We have that blessing. But again, nothing compares to his written word. Amen. And having it in your hands, it's so powerful. So if you have it, open it up to that. Psalm 100 verse 4 to 5. Otherwise, it will be up on your screen or you can look on your phones. It says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. I love this passage. I've always loved sharing this passage because it speaks, one, about God's promises through the generations. But it also encourages us, it instructs us that when we come to God, that when we come not only to his church, but wherever you are and you come into the presence of God, whether it is at home, at work, in your car, at a store, and you're seeking the Lord in prayer, that the word says that we should come to him with what? Thanksgiving. And on this special day in Mother's Day, we've come to him. We, we've praised him through worship. We've thanked him for, for our mothers. But what more has God done for you or through you? How many of you here, God has healed from an illness? I can put two of my hands and my feet up because God has healed me so many times. And I continue to believe him and I continue to know him as my healer. So how many of you here, God has restored your marriage? Amen. Show a hand or say, that's me over here. Praise God. I always say God has restored my marriage so many times because marriage is hard. <laughs> Let me tell you. Amen. How many of you, God has gotten you through, through a, a difficult situation, maybe a time of grieving, and God has been there for you. Amen. He has comforted you. He has done so much for us. And the word says that we should thank him in everything, not just in the victories. Because even in the trials, in those difficult times, that's when we go through a process of discovery of who God is. We go through a process of trusting God. So even in those difficult times, we praise God and we thank him even that for those times because he showed us himself to us. Amen. And we're always learning. We're always growing. So I encourage you here today to reflect on God's goodness. Um, like I said, um, God has been so good to me and I'm okay with boasting because he is good all the time. He is not only brought me salvation, uh, the Lord has taken me from a dark place in my youth. I grew up, I've shared this before, but I grew up Catholic, and in my teens, I, I wanted to do my own thing, like many of us here. So I went off, and I did my own things. I, I, I wasn't following God's ways until I met my husband. Even then, we weren't doing things, the most pleasing things unto the Lord, but God is good. Amen. He saved me. I'm here today because of that salvation. So there's no greater joy than the salvation that comes from Jesus. Because otherwise, I'm not going to go into the, um, the, the place of eternity or eternal damnation. But I don't know about you, but I don't want to end up in eternity in a place that is constant pain. I want to be in heaven with my Lord. So through that is salvation. Another thing that I'm always grateful for is my husband. I know he's out there, Pastor David, he's out there checking the air, their areas, rejoicing and seeing the kids' ministry or the youth. And so um, God has restored our marriage too. How many of you are new, newlyweds? Maybe five to seven within that five-year time frame? You're fairly new to marriage? God bless you. <laughs> we need more of the Lord. Because there's a saying out there where I've heard this before that if you get past the first five to seven years of your marriage, you've pretty much kind of made it because the roughest and the toughest times are in the beginning. Because no one, believe me, no one prepares you to do in life with someone else who carries their own baggage. So imagine two people, he's got his baggage, I got my baggage, and we're trying to live together. 
We're trying to do life together. And forget adding kids to the mix. Things get a lot more complicated, right? Amen? You've been there. And you know that, that song by the Beatles, All You Need Is Love? All you need is love, 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 love is all you need. Nonsense. Total lie. Lie. You can sing it, and it's great, and I love it, but it's a lie. Don't, don't fall for that. It took a lot of commitment. It took remembering our, our covenant, uh, the vows that we took before the Lord. It took a lot of patience, right? It took a lot of forgiveness. A lot of times there's things that you need to come clean with your spouse, I, that wasn't even in my notes, but if you're feeling the tug of the Lord that you need to come clean with your spouse in something, whatever it is, whether it was an issue of sin or betrayal or whatever it is that's weighing on you, and God is calling you to do life his way, it requires repentance in that area. It requires you coming clean to your spouse, asking for forgiveness. So I encourage you to do that. Um, it took a lot of trust. A lot of humor. How many of you love humor? You know that I have a great time with a husband like mine. He's constantly making me laugh. And, and I know he, he tells me sometimes, like, you've heard my lessons like a million times, right? And I said, yeah. So nothing's new to you. And I'm like, no, not, nothing's really new. I've heard it all. But there's once in a while when you'll see me cracking up because I'm like, the things that come out of his mouth, I'm like, even when he's up here, I'm like, oh, God, help us. Like, <laughs> God, help us. And, and I'll take notes and I'll be like, next service, can you not say that? Because... <laughs> Or it is sometimes, you know, he's always making me laugh. But it requires humor. You need to have, you know, a good time with your spouse. If you forget how to laugh with your spouse, there's, there's problems there. I can tell you that. And it took communication. It took sincerity. It took communication. It took opening up to one another, getting to know each other. Amen. So I'm grateful for the work that God has done in our life. So I'm here to encourage you to speak gratitude into your everyday life. When was the last time you, you called on the Lord and you started off with thankfulness? A lot of times we come to God with our needs, and that's good because God is faithful. He is good, and, and he tells us to come to him with everything, with, with petitions, with supplication, it says in Philippians. But it also says with thanksgiving, not just seeking for that um, resolution of that problem that you, we have or an issue that we have going on. Let's come to him with that gratitude. So before we even start with our needs, with uh, God help me with the kids, help me with, that, with this child who's gone wayward or, or you know how we, Christianese people, we Christians like to say, my prodigal son who's out there doing I don't know what. Let's come to him with gratitude. What has he done in your life? What has he already accomplished in you? Thank him. Rejoice in that. And believe me, that will just change your disposition. That will change the environment when we come to God with that adoration, knowing that he's sovereign, that he's in full control of our situation, and that if we know that he's done it once, we believe that he'll do it again and again and again because he is faithful. Amen? And we're not just taking from him. We're giving him that adoration that gratitude, that thankfulness, amen? So in Colossians 3, verse 15 to 17, let me encourage you with this word. It says, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in our hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the Lord Jesus, giving what thanks to God the Father through him. And this is such a beautiful encouragement to us. Amen? Amen. So speak, speak your gratitude out loud. Show our, let's show our kids how to be grateful. Let's show our kids how to Sometimes we just thank God when we're about to eat our meal, right? We're like, bless this meal, Lord, and then let's get to the grub. Let's get to the eating. But you know what? Let's speak it throughout the day. I'm thankful that I get to go to work, even though sometimes we don't want to get up. 
And sometimes we're like, why did you give me this work with this boss? Couldn't you give me a different boss, Lord? But be thankful and say, I'm thankful for, for the provision that you give me. I'm thankful that I get to wake up for the breath that you give me. I'm thankful that I got a good night's rest. I'm thankful that my children are all under the same roof. There's nothing more painful than when you have a sick child in the hospital, maybe. We, we had a time like that once. My husband and I had to alternate taking care of the child who was in the hospital. And then when we all got to go home together, we felt that relief of, God, you're so good. I'm thankful that we're all in the same roof together. Amen. I'm thankful that he delivers us from harm. There's people, even this week... Um, we had a situation where one of our brothers was in an accident, and we can say, like, oh, what a horrible thing to happen. What a horrible accident. Yeah, but he was, he was protected. He was kept away from harm. So even despite the accident, we're grateful that God is good, that he was there, amen, in the midst of that. So we rejoice, and God is giving us so much, so much joy, but he also gives us instruction in the truth of his word. We, we love all the, the parts that make us feel good, right, that encourage us, that lift us up. But then there are some parts, right, in the Bible that kind of sometimes make us a little uncomfortable. But as the Lord is guiding us more into his presence, there's things that we need to face as we want to be in, in, in that presence of God seeking him. He also calls us to turn away from the things that separate us from him. Amen. So I want to touch on that a little bit. I know that's part of the lesson that might make us a little uneasy, but go with me to Ezekiel 18, verse 21 to 23. Okay, verse 21, it says, But if a wicked person turns away from all his sins that he has committed and keeps all my statutes and does what is just and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. None of the transgressions that he has committed shall be remembered against him. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. For the righteousness that he has done, he shall live. This is the word of God. It says, have, have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord, and not rather that he should turn from his way and live so this part of my lesson is called turn away, but turn away from our sinful ways, from even, the word even says from our own way. And the reason I share with you, it's not to bring any type of condemnation or any type of guilt, but it's so that, like you just heard, so that you shall live so that you, have, that you shall have life, like the word says. And to get that life, there's a place where we need to submit to the Lord in repentance and humility. Amen? And I know that word repentance is not something we like to hear. I know for myself, and I speak for myself that, um, as, a, as a new Christian, when I started my, work with, my walk with God, the word repentance carried such a heavy like, connotation. And it still does for some people. Because when we think of that, we think of our sins. We think of the things that we've done wrong. The things that have separated us from God. And when that happens, we encounter a feeling of shame, maybe. A feeling of guilt. And what we call condemnation. But I'm not here to call condemnation upon you. I'm here to call conviction of the Lord upon your life. Amen. And that requires repentance. Coming to the Lord and saying, I know I've been far. I know I've been doing these things. But I'm ready to turn away from it. When we say repentance, we not only mean a change of thinking where we remember the things we did wrong and we say, I know I did this, Lord. But it requires an action. So if I'm going this way in the wrong direction, doing my own thing, sinning, doing life as I want, indulging in all these pleasures of life, and then the Lord calls us to conviction and that repentance, that means we act. We turn away from that, we leave that behind, and we seek the Lord in his direction, seeking his face, amen? That's repentance. That's true repentance. When we act on what the Lord is telling us to do, when we act on leaving behind the things that separate us. The biggest separator from, from Christ, from the Lord, is our sin. Amen? 
And I know when we come into the presence of God, uh, we need to come not only with the disposition of gratitude, but with the disposition of a repented heart. That's what the word calls upon us. And I know I can go on and on talking about sins and all that, but there's other things also that separate us, things that we don't think are that bad or a big deal, like distractions, busyness. Sometimes we get so busy with work that we lose sight of that connection and that um, time with our God. Sometimes there's um, procrastination and, and, and disobedience. Maybe God has already called you on something, but you've just been pull, pulling it, putting it off. Like, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll get to it tomorrow. Uh, we say that in the valley, we live in the land of mañana, or at least I say that because everything is tomorrow, right? Tomorrow. I'll get to it tomorrow. But what if God is calling you to get to that area, to address that area in your life today? Not tomorrow, today. Amen. Um, go with me to Matthew 7, verse 33. This word says, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Heavy word, right? You're like, wait a minute, Sal, what are you saying? I'm not saying it, the word is saying it. So, if you got an issue, take it up with God. <laughs> Amen. Matthew 7, uh, this, this passage speaks about the judgment that we, we cast out to others. That it's so much easier to cast out judgment and to look at our neighbor and say, well, so-and-so is doing that, but I'm not. What I'm doing is not that bad. So it's easier to look outside. But what that word is saying is that instead of looking at the speck in your brother's eye, look at the log in our own eye. And it carries a heaviness, but it's good. Believe me, it's good. Because in doing so, it allows us to look inward, to reflect inwardly. Amen? That's another word that I, I didn't like and I sometimes struggle with because reflection um, causes us to look at ourselves. How many of you love looking at yourself? Sometimes we don't even like looking in the mirror. My sister over there is just like, I love it. Praise God. Um, but sometimes we don't even like looking at the reflection in the mirror. At, I'm talking about a physical mirror, right? Um, I wasn't even going to go into this, but uh, this couple weeks ago, we had a meeting with the women, and um, the, the, the teacher, the preacher, um, she did an illustration where she brought little mirrors, actual mirrors, and she asked us to look in that mirror and with, and, and with our own eyes, think about what's, what we see in ourselves, the good, the bad. And then she went on in her preaching, and then she said later on, look at how your children see you, the good in you how nurturing you are, how caring you are, to see how much they love you. And then at the end, she said, look at how God sees you. And that wrecked all of us. I think well, I was probably practically in tears also. Look at how God sees you. Amen? So that's part of reflecting. And in the spirit, we reflect on who we are. When we look inward at our emotions. Um, reflect, it's okay, look inside. What kind of emotions have you been carrying lately? Have they been words of encouragement, emotions of, of joy, of peace, or have they been negative emotions? Have you been down on yourself? Have you been depressed? Look at your triggers. When we look inward, we can look at our triggers. What triggers us? What makes us mad? What makes us uncomfortable? What makes us nervous? What irritates us? Amen? What, what tempts us? What is, when you look inward, you can also think about what is tempting you. What is causing you to sin during this season? And I said it earlier that temptations just don't fall from the sky. I mean, I don't know if they do. Maybe they do. But in my experiences, temptations have been more of decisions. What have we decided to engage in? What have we been watching? What have we been listening to? What have we been doing? Amen? So this is reflecting. This is looking inward. And I'm doing it for you a little bit up here. And believe me, it gets a little uncomfortable when I start talking about those other heavier things. Amen? The heavier things that separate us from God. I'm just going to share a few when it comes to the area of 
sexual sin. And if you're convicted, praise the Lord for that. Sex outside marriage, pornography, sexual identity, and many more. When it comes to our thought patterns, um, anger, envy, sexual thoughts, negative thoughts, unbelief. When it comes to thinking about the things that separate us from God, has it been overindulgences in maybe social media, phones, TV, entertainment? Everybody has an iPhone, right, now? And everything is so readily accessible at the click of our finger. We don't even have to get smarter or more intelligent because if you have a question, you just Google it, right? It, so it's, it's different now. Our kids are exposed to so much in just Instagram and all these things. And I know that's probably going off on, a, on another turn. But the point is, is that these things also distract us. They take up so much of our time. Um, my husband um, has been joking around with me and telling us that, um, that we're going to get dumb phones. You all know which those are the, the dumb phones are? If you're over 40 or 50, you know what I'm talking about, right? Those little flip phones that you just open and all that it does is call or maybe, and if you wanted a text, you had to click like a hundred letters and then you had to do like the number seven because it had three different types of letters. And anyway, if you're over 50, you know what I'm talking about. But why not? Why not start a trend when we're saying we're putting this down, you know, we're not having dinners with the phone on our face anymore. We're not just sitting in the room or watching TV when our kids are, are seeking our attention, amen, or not even paying attention to the person that's sleep, sleeping next to you, right, because we're distracted. But more than that, worse than that is losing our focus from the Lord because of these things that are trivial, that don't even matter in the long run, amen. amen. So that's what... Reflection, self-reflection does. That's what repentance does. So I think as the more that I thought about this lesson, my encouragement to you is to stop thinking about repentance in such a negative way, with such a negative connotation, but start looking at it as an opportunity to draw closer to God, to start looking at it as a good thing. It's a good thing that the Lord convicts us. It's good. It's a blessing. From there comes blessing and rejoicing and accepting our condition and seeking to be more like Christ. Amen. So it's a good thing. Repentance is a good thing. Amen. Amen. And when I was thinking about this, um, this whole lesson made me think of um, John 4. If you know your Bible, in John 4 there's a passage that speaks about a woman at a well who encounters Jesus. Jesus was passing by, and he stops. His disciples go off and go get food or whatever, and he stops, and he stays there, and this woman meets him there, and he tells her, woman, get me a drink of water. I'm going to paraphrase, right? Don't, don't, don't quote me and be like, Pastor still said, woman. Uh, no. He said, give me a drink of water, and she says, why are you talking to me pretty much? I'm a Samaritan woman, and Jewish people don't associate with the Samaritans, much less a Jewish man. And they had this conversation, and Jesus tells her, um, I have something to offer you. I have something to offer you that will satisfy you. Unlike the water from this well, the water that I'm offering you will bring full satisfaction. You will never thirst again. He offers her what it says on the Bible, rivers of living water. Can you imagine that? And then he tells her, go bring your husband. So he calls her out on her sin, right? Because she goes, I don't have a husband. And, he, and then he tells her, you're right. You don't have a husband. You've had five husbands. Bang. And the one you're with is not even your husband. So can you imagine if God called out our sin right here, like, you know, maybe it's just one-on-one. -on -one. You know, you're like, what? What's going on? How does he know everything? The Lord knows everything. We can try to decorate our sin and make it look pretty and try to, try to make it look okay in front of others or in front of society. But in front of the Lord, we, he knows it's sin. It's sin. We know it's sin. Amen? But what's beautiful about this story is not just that Jesus calls her on her sin. is that despite her sin... He still offers her living water. So Jesus is still doing that same invitation for us today. 
that despite our sin, despite those shameful things that we carry, he still offers us life. He still offers us living water. Living water. He offers us his Holy Spirit to live in us. Amen. So I love this story because it reminds me of God's goodness. So let's be more like this woman who encountered Jesus. Now go with me to Acts 3, verse 19 to 21. It says, repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. So what is this verse telling us? Is that... When we're in the presence of the Lord, there is a refreshment. There is refreshing of our soul. So my last point is be refreshed. I don't share all this, like I said, to condemn or call anybody out. But it's so that we are refreshed as a church. And I started off with speaking to you about our TFC nights. And I wanted you to get on the same page. What we're seeking for is a time of refreshment. But to do that, we also need a time of repentance. It's like we can't just seek the victory and all of the good things that God has to offer to us without seeking, being in that humility of repentance. They both come hand in hand. When we come to the Lord in humility and repentance and he forgives our sins and he washes us clean and he makes us new, then God refreshes us. Then we enter that time of rejoicing. Amen. So this is what I want for our church. For us to be in that same spirit. That every single person here will be whole, will be full of the spirit, will be joyful, will have peace, or have an abundance of the Lord in their life. Amen. And I love the story of the women at the well. Because Jesus tells her, right, about the living water. And after she, the woman realizes that, that Jesus was a prophet, that he knew, her, he knew her, she tells him, okay, well, I can see that, that you're a prophet. Now tell me this, where will we worship? In the mountains like our ancestor d- did, our ancestors Jacob? Or like you Jewish people say, shall we go to the temple in Jerusalem and worship there? And then Jesus tells her something so powerful um, that I would love for you to hear. It says, he tells her, but the hour is coming and now is here when the true worshipers will worship the Father and Spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So he pretty much tells her, you can worship anywhere. In the mountain, in the temple, in your home, in your work, in your car. But what the Father is really looking for is true worshipers. Worshipers that will worship in that spirit with gratitude, with thankfulness, with celebration. Worshipers who will receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the living person of God who comes and dwells in us. That is why Jesus did all that he did so that we will be saved and receive. When Jesus left, he says, I don't leave you like orphans. I leave you with a comforter. And why was that better? Because anywhere we go, we have the Holy Spirit living in us. Amen. Amen. And he says, worshipers in spirit and in truth. In truth, not living our own life our own way or according to what we think is right, according to what society thinks is is acceptable or um, okay, or if everybody else is doing it, then I'm going to do it, so hence okay. No, but living by the truth that comes from the word of God that includes repentance of our sins, that includes turning away from what separates us. Amen. It includes his spirit, his goodness. It includes his truth. It includes abiding in him. It includes living a life that is pleasing unto the Lord. And more than anything, it requires us to be genuine. It requires us that when we come into the presence of God, that when we seek him, we seek him with all our heart. Amen? Amen. And that we seek him in truth. 
walking in his ways, believing his words. Amen. And now let me share with you, for those of you, how many of you, and be honest, um, which I, I'm pretty sure there's many of you, you believe that you worship in spirit and in truth. Yes? You believe you can call yourself a true worshiper. Amen? Praise God for that. Amen? But now there's some of you here who are maybe still struggling with that part. I'm not quite there, so. But I'm here to tell you that you can be. You can be that true worshiper because the word of God speaks it. And that's what the Father is seeking for us to be in that place. Now, I saw this um, kind of worship on Wednesday night and with that all close. Not so that you can think, oh, I wish I would have been there or man, I missed it. But so that you can rejoice in what is happening in your church. Amen. Wednesday night, well, let me go back to Monday night. Pastor David shared a word with us. He said, we believe the presence of the Lord is here, that there will be powerful things that will happen in this place. Um, and we saw it. We saw it come to pass. Um, during those nights, we had worship. We had a word. We had encouragement. At the end, we had altar call. We had a time of altar call for repentance, for seeking the Lord. And during those three nights, we saw so much, de we saw deliverance. I mean, some of you were like, what's deliverance? Okay, well, del I'm, I don't have time to go into all that. But there's people that are oppressed by evil things, by demons, by the enemy trying to attack you. And there was deliverance. And let me tell you that I know there's a lot of people here in this place. And I know that there are people who are being attacked in that sense. But there is deliverance through Christ. And we saw it. And we believe it. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord for that. We saw forgiveness. We saw joy. We saw dancing. In the beginning, we said, some of you here, um, you've never danced in the spirit. And some of you here are like, what is that? What do you eat it with? What does that mean? I want to know more. Praise God for that. But that was just a time where we were just so full of the spirit, so joyful, so um, full of the presence of God that we started jumping and dancing and rejoicing and, and showing that praise to God. Now, that may be for some of you. Maybe for some of you, you're like, I'm good here. I like to sit in my chair, and, and I like to worship in spirit and in truth in this way. And that's good, too. There's reverence there. But what matters is that there is a true reverence to the Lord. Amen? So you didn't have to be up here, and that was okay. We saw people who were sitting in the back rejoicing. But the point of the matter is that that is available to us today, that that kind of power is available to you and I if we decide to submit our whole life to God. If we decide that we want to be those true worshipers in spirit and in truth, amen? And this is what we want for you as a church. This is what we love to see. This is why we do the things we do. This is why Pastor David preaches a thousand messages, right? This is why Pastor Trey, Pastor Carl, our, our lay ministers, Mariel, um, Jesse, Obed, and many others, and the people from our McAllen campus, all those ministers, this is why we do what we do. Because we want to see people set free. We want to see people who submit to God every area of their life, not just the things that are visual to the people outside, but everything in your heart that you submitted to God, that there's people that are saved, that are snatched away from the hand of the evil one, and you're freed to live a life in Christ, that there is a freedom to praise, to dance, to sing, and it doesn't matter what your neighbor is thinking. I know this is another rant, but a lot of times we stand here and we do this, and, and, and sometimes it's okay, and that's, that's true to you, but sometimes there's a desire for you to do more and praise at a greater level, but we're thinking about our neighbor. And instead of looking upward, we're looking to the sides. I think it's time that we just set our eyes on Jesus. And the next time you praise and the next time you come before the Lord, you do it with that exaltation of your heart, with that 
joy, with that peace, with that surrender, with that speaking gratitude over your life, speaking life over you, with that humility of understanding the condition of your heart, how that sin separate us, separates us, but that Jesus restores that relationship with our Lord. And through Jesus, we receive the Holy Spirit. Amen? And through Jesus, you have rivers of living water overflowing out of you. And that everything you give, it's from the presence of God. Amen. Let us pray today. If you can bow down your heads, pray with me. And you speak to God from your heart. I know we have a room full of Christians, people who have received Christ in the past. But I know that there's people in here who have been distant, who have been separate, separated from the Lord who you've had trouble worshiping, who you've had, where you have trouble even coming to prayer or seeking him because of that sin that hinders you. And today, I'm gonna ask you to make a recommitment to God, to make a recommitment to live for him, to acknowledge your sin, but to turn away from it, that you would act today that there is something in you that you need to stop doing, that you would do it, stop doing it in the name of Jesus. If there's a sinful act that you've been doing, that you will stop doing it in the name of Jesus and that you turn your face to seek the Lord and that you want to recommit to living a life for Jesus. If that's you today, I want to ask you to raise your hand. Remember, there's no shame in this room. Amen, amen. So if you want to draw closer to God, if you've been distant, if you need more of God, raise up your hand as a show of faith and a show of commitment. I believe that the Lord acts through our faith. Now there's, you may put your hand down. Now there's some of you here today who never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And today has been new to you and that you're ready to make that commitment to receive Christ as your savior, to receive the salvation that he offers, to know that your sins are forgiven, that you can come to him in full repentance and that he is faithful and just to forgive you and give you his Holy Spirit. I want you to raise up your hand too. Amen, amen. Anyone else? I see your hand, sister. Praise the Lord for your submission and your commitment. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. You can put your hands down. Now we're going to repeat a prayer. If you can repeat after me. Say, God, I believe in your son, Jesus, that he died for me. And on the third day he rose. I believe that my sins are forgiven. I repent of my old life and commit this life to you. I receive you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. I thank you that I have an eternal home in heaven and your Holy Spirit lives in me. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Let's give praise to God.